decide which topic she would speak about today, but I think the most um, fascinating one and aligned with our mission is that she's engaged with CASA, and that's Court Appointed Special Advocates. And what that means she will share with us in a moment, and I'm very happy she takes the time out of her busy schedule to be with us and talk about the topic. Thank you. So thank you, thanks Sebastian for inviting me here today. The, I was just telling a couple people during the breakfast that the last two talks I gave to the Rotary Club, one was the San Francisco Rotary Club, and then I, a couple weeks later, spoke at the San Jose Rotary Club, and at that time I was the Vice President of Corporate Marketing Communications for the San Francisco 49ers. And oh. the subject I was talking about was the stadium. And uh, in San Francisco, it was a packed audience, and they were very opinionated, and there was all this controversy. <laughs> and then I went down to San Jose, and there was you know, 350 people there, and there was, uh, they were all you know, excited and ready to go, and wanted to know, you know when they could get their tickets. So there was, you know, it was just a period of many years of a lot of controversy. Um, so I'm happy to say that the subject I'm here to talk about today um, is really not something that people would disagree about. Uh, there's not a lot of controversy around this subject. Um, and as I was um, running things at the 49ers, the, the business side, one of my responsibilities was the 49ers Foundation. And in part of that role, I learned about this organization, this nonprofit organization called CASA of San Mateo County, Court Appointed Special Advocate. And I learned about the program and thought, boy, when I have a little bit more time, that's something that, that I think I would like to do as a volunteer. As, as a you know, corporate, in, being in the corporate world, I always was on nonprofit boards as a board member. And I decided that what I was going to do was really get more involved and be able to work with the people that nonprofits um, benefit in terms of sort of the end user, if you will. So let me just explain what this organization is and why I'm passionate about it and why I spend an entire day every week uh, volunteering for this. So orphan is not a word that we use much anymore. Um, and orphanages are something that we think have been eliminated in this country. They bring up the image of um, you know, Charles Dickens and you know, a little boy asking for more porridge and being told no. And so you know, we sit here in San Mateo County, you know, with all the wealth and Silicon Valley and the money and the nice cars and everything, and it's hard to know that there are orphans among us every day. There are orphans among us in San Mateo, and we have not solved the problem. And the situation happens um, when a child is removed from the family, and children are removed from their family generally because of... Mm -hmm. Um, the parents not being able to care for them, and it's usually, um, you know, some sort of uh, medical problem with the parents, drug addiction, alcoholism, abuse, um, lots of psychiatric problems. And then that child, once they're removed, they are in the foster care system for 18 months to two years. And during that time, they could get bounced around different foster homes and the attempt at that time is to get the parents to get their act together. They have to go to drug counseling or alcohol counseling or go get psychiatric medications and show that they can stay on. And the court then requires the parents to do things to be able to get the child back. During this time, the child is in complete limbo. They are suddenly have all these strangers in their lives. They have social workers, lawyers, psychiatrists, judges, all these people that suddenly are in their lives deciding what they're going to do, and they make the decision. So there, in 1976, there was a judge in Seattle, a family court judge in Seattle, um, who, his name is Judge David Soap, and he, he just felt uncomfortable that he was making these decisions about these children that were in the foster care system and not really knowing whether the decision he was making about their lives and where they were going to be placed was the right decision. So he started this organization called CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocate. And they, they find people like me, and we go through 50 hours of training, and I did that a couple years ago, and we get fingerprinted and you know all that, checked out by the FBI and everything like that, including our driving record. 
And, um, and then our goal is to be, we get assigned to a child. In, the, in my case, I, I picked a, a child who had two siblings and I took all three of them. And we don't, we don't take them into our home. We're actually not allowed to bring them into our homes. But what we do is each week we go and meet with them, pick them up, and we're, we're appointed by the court. So we have some authority that the foster parent can't say no, he didn't make his bed so he can't go with you today. And we go and we get the child and we form a relationship with them. We go to the schools and we meet with the principals and the teachers and we say, all right, well this child seems to have a speech problem. Where is the therapy? You know, where is the speech therapist? Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing this? We meet with the teachers. We explain what's going on with the child, and try and help make sure that they're getting the attention that they need um, in the school. We sometimes, in, in my case, I'm the only reason these three siblings are even seeing each other. I pick one up, and I pick the other up, and I get them to a park. I try and get social worker drivers to. You know, when they, when they get placed far away, I try and get them to come together so that these children, who have now no parents in their lives, can at least um, see their siblings. And um, and so we, those are the types of things that we do. And then we write a report um, once a month, just a short couple paragraphs, that gets sent to the judge, gets sent to the caseworker. And then when there's a court hearing every six months, we go to court, and the judge asks us our opinion. I got a call um, just a couple weeks ago, which I thought was completely out of my realm. And the social worker called and asked if the child should continue on psychiatric medication that they were on. And I was just like, this is, they're asking me? You know, I'm a marketing executive, why are they asking me? But it's, but it's just like everybody is then feeling like they need to involve the CASA um, in the decisions around this child. So I want to give you a little bit of um, understanding about the situation that I had. So I'm sitting in the CASA offices after having been trained, and they, I'm sitting with these huge stacks of cases from the San Mateo County Family Services. And I'm reading through one horrible story based in San Mateo after another. And I'm trying to decide which child I'm going to pick. Because then you see that child until they get eventually permanently placed in there. And so I, I picked a, a story um, that involved three children, um, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, 14-year-old, and the parental rights were terminated. So these parents, the CASAs are only assigned to children who are victims of abuse and neglect. And usually we get the worst cases. Um, so these parents were so bad, their rights have currently been terminated. They are not allowed anywhere near their children. The children were sent to a foster home in Folsom, and I'm making up these names and I'm making up the cities because obviously there's a lot of confidentiality around there. There's, they were sent to a home in Folsom and the social work agency didn't do their job. They didn't stay on top of it. They didn't determine what was going on in that home because what happens in San Mateo County is that because we're a wealthy county, we tend to not have people that are willing to be foster parents in San Mateo. There's very few foster parent homes. And so what happens is that if a child gets removed from a home in San Mateo County, often the only foster home they can find to put the child in is somewhere outside of the county. So they go down to, you know, south of San Jose or Salinas or Hollister or Pacifica. Actually, Pacifica is where they ended up, the children I had ended up, and that was actually close um, for us. And so that's one of the problems that San Mateo County has, is that we don't have foster homes, very many, here. And so these children were removed, they were, they were sent to, let's just say, a, a home in, in Folsom. And the, parent, the foster parents just pulled the older girl out of school and homeschooled. But what she really was doing was working in the family business. And nobody was overseeing this. The younger girl was being, they were being told that they were doing all these terrible things, but when the new caseworker came on and checked into it, it turns out that the teacher had never even said those things. So sometimes foster parents are, are good foster parents and they're doing it not just for the money but also to help the child. 
Other times they try and make the, chi the child seem worse so that the county will give them more money. And these people were getting a lot of money anyway to take care of these children. And they refused to adopt them. So after five and a half years, these children were removed from the home, and this is the only parents that the two younger ones even remembered. So when they say mom and dad, it wasn't even their real mom and dad. It was this temporary home that they had been in. The judge determined this home they'd been in for five years was unfit to be a foster home. So you can only imagine what happened. And then they went to a very nice home um, in Daly City and, um, and then started to get the care that they needed. When I met them, none of the three of them had ever had a birthday party. They had never been to the zoo. They, had, they didn't know how to ride bikes. <laughs> they didn't know how to swim. Um, and you know, you, it just, it's hard to imagine um, the, the, to me, the one of the worst one was nobody ever read to them. So of course that effect, affected, if no one reads to you, it affects your cognitive ability, it affects your ability to be a good writer, to be a good reader, all those things. And so we started to rectify these things, you know, try to take them to the studio, try and do these uh, things for them. The youngest girl, who's been bounced around the most, is extremely bright. When I met with the, with the teachers, they said if it wasn't for the turmoil in her life, they would probably consider her gifted. This child, during the time I knew her in second grade, was in five different foster homes, in five different schools in second grade. And this is right here in our backyard. And so now this, um, and what happens is that Obviously, she started to sort of act out. You know, she wasn't a perfect child. The ch what foster children often do when they're removed from the home is they start hoarding food. They they tend to not want to bathe, um, which is you know basically this whole thing about self care, not being ever taught um, self care. And then they tend to take things because they're it's it's the way for them to control their environment. They're afraid that they're going to be left with nothing, so they take things that aren't theirs. So each time this child did that, the foster parents said, well, I don't want her here, and they kicked her out. And so she ended up in five different homes. And so eventually, this girl has ended up in a group home now, and we've, it's kind of like it's been, you know, after each time she acts out, she's becoming criminalized. Do you know what I mean? And there's a fine line between children who are just in the foster care system because their parents messed up, to a child who then moves over to become a juvenile boy. That hasn't happened yet, but we are really close on that line. Now the good news is, the older girl, who wanted to be pulled out to homeschool, we've given her tutors, we've given her all sorts of things. I got her a $1,000 scholarship to the computer science camp in Palo Alto, and she went to the computer science camp and actually was very good at math. And she has done extremely well, and the parents, the foster parents that she's with have now miraculously decided to adopt her. And she's going through the, they're going through the adoption process and will be figured out in the next five months. And the transformation from when I first met this girl, where she could barely look at me and barely communicate to who she is now, where she could probably come up here and give a talk about her experience. She's confident, she's happy, you know, as happy as she's ever going to be, given that she'd been through much, so much trauma. The, the young, the boy, who was around nine, again, a miracle, somebody decided to adopt him. And I think maybe it was because the parents are out of the picture, so they don't, they're not worried about the parents coming back and he's really proving or whatever. But the bad news is, is that the boy, the brother, um, is now being adopted on the East Coast. Oof. So the children, you know, the only family they, the only true family they have is now being completely torn apart. Um, and then the youngest one is the one that I'm still working with and still going to see um, on a weekly basis. So we need um, we need more casas um, in San Mateo County. We have a disproportionate number of women volunteers than men. Um, we have a lot of boys, and it would be nice for them to have male volunteers. So if anybody has any ideas about 
how we could generate more interest in um, CASA volunteers. That would be terrific. Um, we have uh, fundraisers that go on and, and all that type of thing as well. It costs about $2,500 to train a CASA volunteer, and that's pretty much when CASA raises their money. They're raising money to um, hire, to get the staff in and the resources in to train people like me to be able to go out and do what I do and have an impact um, in San Mateo. Right now, there's about 175 foster or children who've been removed from their home over in this peer, this limbo period, the 18 months to two years, who need a, a CASA. And they're only on the list because they've been victims of abuse and neglect. Um, so we're always looking for new CASA volunteers. Um, and again, what I the uh, expectation is that you spend 10 hours a month on this um, as a volunteer and form the relationship with the kid, do the kind of thing a parent would do, ask the right questions, assess the situation. Is this child being cared for? Are they getting bathed? Is the foster family paying, using the money that they're getting to actually feed them and clothe them? Um, are they getting psychiatric care? Are they getting uh, the help that, uh, that they need? Um, how am I doing on time? Fine. Fine. I agree? Okay, because I, I do have a little video that I um, wanted to show. We have a so, solid 10 minutes left. Okay, so one of the, um, the really endearing stories I had is my very first trip with them, I took them to the San Francisco Zoo. And again, these children have done nothing like that. And the boy who was nine years old um, would stand in front of each sign like this. And he, he, um, he had a lot, of, at this point, a lot of learning disabilities because as a baby, they had just left him alone for long periods of time. So he had developed the cognitive skills and the speaking skills that you would expect of a nine-year-old. But he'd stand in front of the sign, and he would stand there until I would read him the entire sign about the display. You know, where all the other kids are running around screaming and yelling. He would just stare at all the words and listen to me read every single thing and then he would stare at the exhibit and ask me all these questions about everything in the exhibit and then he would walk over and he'd stand in front of the next sign and then I had to read. So it was really clear that he wanted to learn but this never, never having had this kind of one-on-one -on -one attention was um, really, really evident. I always would, when I would be with them, and it was hard having three kids, you know, who are not your own, trying to keep the energy going. I would always ask them questions to get them thinking about things. And so I asked them when we went to the zoo, I said, why do you think the San Francisco Zoo was built right next to the ocean? So if you've been there, you know, it's right on the slope, and it's just, you can see the ocean right there. And the youngest girl, the one they said was very bright, was very bright, teachers and said that. She piped up and she said, well, I know why. And I said, why? She goes, well, it's because of Noah's Ark. <laughs> you know, the Ark pulled up, and they only had a walk. They had to walk two by two down this block. And they turned right, and they went right into the kitchen. <laughs> so somewhere along the line, someone had told her this story, and, um, and she had put two and two together. Um, for the oldest girl, I had applied to get scholarships because there's different, for a CASA worker, there's different scholarships. You know, there's things you can apply for and try and get. And I applied for this computer scholarship in, in Palo Alto. And she was um, going, you know, we had to get a county driver to pick her up. And then I would go down to Palo Alto and pick her up and take her back. And so there was all this logistics that had to happen because the foster parents, you know, were like, well, that's great. She's going to camp, but I'm not driving her to Palo Alto. And um, so the third, the second day, I think she gets in the car and she's quiet, and, you know, trying to get her to talk. And she goes, "Well, I, did, I didn't want to tell you this." And I said, "Well, no, it's all right. If you want to tell me, go ahead." She goes, "But I think I should." And I was like, "All right." You know, we went back and forth trying to drag it out of her. And finally, she told me her big news. She doesn't like computer programming. <laughs> and I said to, and that was what the campus was about. And I said to her, I said. Well, that's okay. So 
said, you don't have to like it, but you have to do it. <laughs> you have to go. You have, you, you've won the scholarship, and you're going to go every day because we don't quit. And then I realized, as I said, we don't quit, that in my family, I can say that mm -hmm. to my kids, you know, the Langs, we don't quit. You know, the McCulloughs, you know, we don't, you know, we don't lie. We don't do whatever it is you don't do in your family. But when you're a child with no parents and no relatives that are allowed to go near you, what, who is we, right? No. Who are we? What do we stand for? And as those words came out of my mouth, that we don't quit, you know, I realized, it's me, I'm the only one. I'm her person. There's nobody else. There's nobody else consistent in this child. So, um, you know, the story now is very good. Two are being adopted, one's a group home. We're trying to find a family that would take her just as a foster child. But these are just three stories among probably 250 that are active right now um, in San Mateo County. And given all the excellent work the Rotary Club does, I thought it was important that I spend my 15 minutes of fame here giving you uh, the understanding about the organization and the role that you play in this uh, really difficult transitionary period in these kids' lives. So do we have time to play the video? It's, you know, short, but um, it'll just give you a little bit more forward. As children, we've all had the experience of awakening from a terrible nightmare only to be comforted by a loving mother or father. But there are many children right here in our community who live out the real nightmare of being abused by a parent. A parent who should, instead, be providing love and protection. These are our children, the children of CASA. We stand up for them to make sure they never again have to live this nightmare. of volunteers that is dedicated to helping children who have been abused and neglected. Our CASA volunteers work one-on-one -on -one with these deserving children. Our greatest challenge is that there are so many more children on our wait list. Children end up in the foster care and come under the protection of the court because their parent has abused, neglected, or abandoned their child. CASA volunteers just give support and love to children that are going through very difficult times one child at a time. And they said, I can do that. I can definitely love one child at a time. <coughs> Dylan was labeled unadoptable. I think it's really a shame that any child can be labeled unadoptable. All they need is somebody that loves them and cares about them and will be there for them. He went through a lot of abuse himself, plus witnessing abuse. He has trouble sleeping at night. He needs to have the lights on. And it's just, it's been rough for him. One day when we went out, he called me mom. And he said, can I just call you mom? And I explained to him why he couldn't call me mom. The next couple of days, he asked his teacher if he could call her mom, which really broke his heart. Oh, I am so fond of him. I would do anything for him. Um, He's, he's just a wonderful kid, and he deserves to have a wonderful life. He called me about six months after he got adopted, and he said, Hey, Daisy, guess what? And I said, What? And he said, I got glasses. And I said, Oh, you do? I said, Is that a good thing? And he goes, Yeah, now I look like the rest of my family. <laughs> when the adoption was final, I took Dylan shopping. And I told him he can buy anything that he wants for his family, but he has to choose it. We were in there about a minute 
And he came up and he said, okay, Daisy, I have what I want. And I said, would you want to look around? He said, no, I have what I want. And I looked at it, it makes me cry. And it's this little rock, and on it says, I will never leave you. I will never leave you. I volunteer because the lives these kids leave in the dependency system just breaks my heart. These kids are there for no fault of their own, but they leave a very tough life. You know, the teenage boys that I've worked with may have changed uh, foster homes several times. They've got different therapists, different teachers, different social workers. It's a very tough existence, and I can just provide a little bit more humane help to these kids while they're in the system. My name is Jay Sean Edison. I'm a former CASA youth in Carmichael County. I ended up in the foster care system because my mom, she gave me up when I was six years old. I grew up in an environment where I was just stuck in the room all day, stuck to myself, and she told me that she didn't want me living there, so she uh, took me to the police station and left me there. <laughs> Let's go. And then they ended up taking me to a, a foster uh, group home. That's the only problem I had was feeling very abandoned by the people that I thought that really cared about me. Me and my council worker was the best experience I ever had in my life. He showed me what a real father figure was. He took me out, he did my homework with me, you know, and he just showed me all together that he was a good person. And I could still call him at any time of the day and know that he would always be there because he wasn't just a council worker. He was a friend, but more of a friend, he was a father figure at that. He's very honest, and I like it. I'm just happy I got a chance and to do better in my life. I believe I could influence and provide knowledge, you know, from being a former foster youth. I did want to make a difference in my own life, and I think uh, being a CASA has allowed that to happen. I've been given the gift, really, of being able to see the world through a child's eyes again. We invite you to imagine their difficult world and envision with us the wonderful day when we'll be able to provide a CASA volunteer for every child who needs one. That hangs in the office of CASA and every time we go in there, you know, there's more leaves on the trees that of kids that, uh, that need CASA workers. So anyway, thank you so much for your attention and your time and uh, I think it's a very worthy cause and it's right here in our own backyard so I wanted to let everyone know. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of minutes for co for questions if it's okay. Okay, that's absolutely right. <clears throat> Uh, these are uh, uh, the kids that are taken care of by a CASA volunteer. They're already in um, a foster home, I assume, huh? Yeah, it's they. There's a period, ideally, as soon as they've been removed from the parents, uh -huh. and they get sent to this receiving center up in off of 280, hmm. and they're there until there's a foster home available to put them in. So they start off sort of in limbo, and then they get put into a foster home, and so we, we get assigned at any point during that process. Ideally, you'd get assigned right away, right? But that doesn't always happen. In my case, I did get assigned right away. About, well, about within a month after they got to the new foster home. Now, what are the ages of the, the kids? You said... What's the ages? Yeah, the age. The, the, uh, the span is, um, actually some people, you know, there's like two years old. Two years old. Well, you, you can choose what age you want, wow. but they start, some people pick really young children, um, and it goes all the way up to 17. Now, the one people that were abusing the kid down in, uh, was it Gilroy? The, the one that- Yeah, in the south. Yeah, did they go to jail? 
Did what? Did the parents go to jail or that those people get any uh, type of the, fine? The parents that were whose rights were terminated, yes. Right. Good. <clears throat> uh, so uh, Jim and I have been uh, uh, to uh, Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been four times yeah. uh, because they have no uh, foster system there. Right. And this is a remnant of the Soviet uh, era of abuse.